I think just allowing your kid to truly just express themselves in the way that they want to, that's just like key to being the most confident and like just set person. Saying like, I don't accept you, but I still love you kind of contradicts itself to me. Yeah, there's no love without acceptance. Folks create the space that they need if they're given the opportunity to do that. Having access to stories and having the media lift up our stories so that people don't have to live that much of their life feeling like they're completely alone. Hey there, my name is Nova Bright, and I am the head of internal training, learning, and development at The Trevor Project. I'm also a new parent, a foster parent, and I got to sit down with six folks to learn more about what they are looking for from a parent or a loved one ways that they could have used support and ways that they found support. I think it's really important that we position ourselves as learners throughout our lives. And so it was so special for me to get to learn from these folks uh, and really show up in a much more uh, authentic way for the LGBTQ young folks in my life. It was a great conversation and I'm so excited for you to get to hear it. And action. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hi. I am so excited to be able to have a conversation with you all today to really talk about ways that we can make an impact on LGBTQ youth's lives. As a parent, what I have seen is that folks can thrive when they are given space to be themselves, but not just given space, but given affirmation and love. And I know that I'll miss the mark on that sometimes. Um, and I know that people in your lives have probably missed the mark on that. And I wanna name those times. I wanna talk about that because I think folks can learn from that, right? So are there any stories that you all can share or thoughts from your own lives about a way that a parent could show up for you or a way that a loved one, we don't have to so focus on parents, right? just a way that an important person in your life could show up for you. I love the fact that you touched on it. It can be a loved one. It doesn't have to be a parent. So for people who are extended family, friends, like I just think it's so important to check up on your friends as kids. It, just any kid that you know, you can be a mentor, you can be anyone because quite honestly, a lot of the time you don't know who is what you might say like in the closet or something like that. And it can really be anyone. So if I truly had like a mentor, and someone that I could just spill my feelings with and get guided advice and really have that wisdom of someone of an older age who's more experienced that like that would have been life changing for me. I think the biggest thing for me has always been encouragement. And that sounds so simple, but just anything that you want to do, having encouragement from your loved ones will take you so far. Um, I think especially just like I write songs and with my music, it's like I like to write about girls, guys, anything in between. And just having that encouragement from like family or friends, just being like, you should be doing this, like this is who you are and this is what you should be writing about instead of shaming me for loving who I love and, and things like that. Just keeping that positive environment for a kid is so important. Definitely, like not shaming somebody for things that they like and letting allowing them to lean into that. Like, for example, when I was younger and I used to be more into like things that were for girls, and my dad would be like, no, why do you like that? That's so womanly, that's for girls and not shaming the person simply because of the things that they like and instead positioning it like, wow, that's so cool. Like you look so pretty and kind of like allowing them to lean into those things, you know? I think heteronormativity is honestly what I feel like really alienates um, the queer community from like the hetero world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like the expectation that you have to fit into this box. Yeah. I mean, as an intersex person, when you're a kid, doctors and society start telling you from the very moment that you're born, because there's no box for you on a birth certificate, there's literally only male and female. And some of us are born with body parts that are in between. And rather than changing the box to fit the person, they change the person to fit the box. And so from the second that you're born, you're told that your body is inherently a problem, like simply for existing. And it's really hard to unlearn that. And so ideally we can build this society where kids don't have to unlearn 
hate and stigma and shame. They can just be like loved from day one. That's a powerful statement, right? The idea that we should stop trying to fit people into boxes that we've created, right? Yeah, we exist. The boxes don't exist. Right. Someone so, wrote yes. that on a piece of paper <laughs> or printed it out really. somewhere. Right. Like, like we exist here. Just here. Yeah. There's expectations put on children of how they want you want them to act and how you want them to grow up to be and like, you know, what you want them to believe and think about themselves. And I think as long as you have an expectation that your child is going to be loved by your by you, that's the only expectation you really need. I can say something on that too because like I just feel like expressing yourself as a kid is so important and whenever parents try to like limit what their kids do or like mold them into the person that they think they should be that goes beyond just like oh I want to like play with dolls or oh I want to dress up like this and like verge from what's deemed traditional but it ends up like limiting them and thinking that their voice isn't valid that their personality isn't valid that their dreams and goals aren't valid like it goes so far beyond like identity and stuff like that and I think just allowing your kids to truly just express themselves in a way that seems natural to them that they want to, that's just like key to being the most confident and like just set person. These negative stereotypes have like actual lifelong impacts on folks, right? When yeah. you when you don't set them up for uh, feeling loved and embraced for who they are, then that can start to have like an overall negative narrative about their identity or about their lived experience. And that For sure. is a lifelong thing. Yeah. yeah. And with intersex kids too, like you're born and you're told that your body's a problem and that you're going to be fixed to fit into these boxes. And then the doctors and everyone tells you like, never tell anyone about who you are because you'll be made fun of or you'll be ostracized or people will think you're a freak. And so the way that you internalize that as a kid is I'm unlovable because of who I am. You know, even parents that say like, oh, I don't really accept this part of you, but I still love you. That's very passive aggressive to me because it's like, okay, you don't love all of me though, because that is who I am. Like, that's me. So saying like, I don't accept you, but I still love you kind of contradicts itself to me. Yeah, there's no love without acceptance. Yeah, exactly. thousand percent. You can't love without acceptance you also can't raise someone saying you need to hide this part of yourself to find love yeah exactly. like that's not how it works mm -hmm. when i think about what drives me for sure is human connection right and i feel like what i hear some of you saying is that what's important to you is affirmation is love is unequivocal or unquestionable embracing of who you are and all the other stuff is kind of noise. Yeah, parents need to make their kids feel like they're worthy of love no matter who they are, or what yes. they do. Totally. So I'm curious for you all, as you learned about your identities or as you came into your own, what were some of the feelings or narratives or messages that you were hearing and how did you navigate that? I think a lot of what I was hearing was like, oh, it's irreversible, you can't change back. You, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure? And I, would, I was getting a lot of, um, messaging that, you know, I was making the wrong choice, or that I wasn't doing what was right for me. I was, then people wanted me to do what was right for them. And that really messed with me a lot and made me feel unsure about what I was doing. I wasn't feeling unsure until other people told me I should be feeling unsure. I can add on to that because I feel like a lot of people will question you as if you don't know what you're like dealing with. And a lot of people only see like, oh, I'm coming out, but they don't see the 16, 17, 20, 30 years of prior experience and internal just pulling and tugging just that you've had to deal with. So they only see like the coming out stage and they think that this is just like some spontaneous decision. It wasn't new to me, but it was new to them. And because it was new to them, they just invalidate that feeling. Yeah, like why are we always doubting that young people yeah. don't put in the work to figure out who they are, exactly. right? Or that they can't be the best expert in who they are, yeah. right? It's it's like if just because you're young, you don't know anything about yourself. And it's like, well, actually, I know myself better than anybody because yeah. I'm me. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the irony of it is, too, that oftentimes between these parents and doctors, they'll make a decision like, oh, we're gonna make this kid a girl or, oh, we're gonna make this kid a boy. And sometimes it's the wrong decision. And then you have a kid that's growing up and they're like, actually, I identify as a man, no one ever asked me. And so then you see a lot of intersex people transitioning later in life because of 
medical decisions that were made for them in their youth. Yeah. One thing that I notice from a lot of young folks, uh, even the kiddos who have come into my family and, and become a part of my family, is that folks create the space that they need if they're given the opportunity to do that. And I would love to hear ways that you feel like either space has been made for you around your identity or it's okay if it, if it hasn't been, how does space need to be made around your identity? I think when I was like 16 or like even when I was like way younger, it was very frustrating when, you know, when my grandparents or parents would be like, oh, you're going to grow up and meet a nice man and you're going to do this and that. And it was like the traditional, like coming from like, a, I guess, a tr traditional Indian family. It was always that. One thing my parents did is when I moved to college, I would get these frequent phone calls just talking about just to catch up on my life. And it would be like, oh, have you met anyone new? And instead of just saying, oh, have you met any boys? Yeah. And I guess my dad didn't like realize it at the time, but when he would call me and he would say, have you met like anyone or like, you know, it was, it made a huge difference in the way my relationship with him, I became more comfortable. It's just a, a slight change in a choice of wording can make such a huge difference. Yeah, like inclusive language matters. Absolutely, yeah. Right? Absolutely. And non-assumptive language matters. Right. For me, I feel like all throughout my life, people have been labeling me before I even knew what I wanted to be labeled as, telling me, oh my God, you're so gay. Like, and I'm like, I don't know. You don't even know what it means to be gay. And um, getting to this point where I'm like, well, I don't know, like, am I gay? And my mom, you know, as a mother, she wanted me to come out of the closet so badly but the way she went about it was just not the right way. And she was almost trying to force me out of the closet. And not that she had any malicious intentions. I think my mom is like my number one fan um, today. But she was just trying so hard to get me to come out of that space and to just be open and be myself that it made me depressed. I was like, I'm not ready. Something similar like happened to me um, in high school. I actually got outed by my basketball coach who told like my principal, told some of my friends, told the teachers. And it spread and it went all the way to my family. The fact that he took that from me and um, pulled all of my loved ones for me, like, made me just so depressed. And I know it doesn't, like, seem like a big deal to these people, but, like, to, so, like, queer people, like, it's the end of the world. And now it's, like, everyone knows your secret. So I definitely think, like, it's so much better when, when we're able to express it ourselves on our own time, like you guys were saying good rule of thumb right like if someone's coming out to you they're coming out to you right and i think one of the things i hear folks talking about is the coming out process is your own right it is not for your family to decide or to tell you how to come out when to come out where to come out with my mom it was almost the opposite and that once i came out i wanted to come out to my whole family and she was like no, but your grandmothers are so old, they're not going to be able to understand. Or like, they're not, like, they're too old to get it. Like, don't go through that. And I, just like with you said with your mom, it's not malicious intent. Like, she just wanted to, like, embrace you and accept you, but you weren't ready. And for me, I think my mom wanted to prevent me from explaining something to people who might not accept me. My grandmothers were more religious, etc. It needs to be on our own time. Exactly. <laughs> it needs to happen when it's time to happen when it's time for to that happen person. right and nobody knows that but you nobody knows that but you i also think for me i hope that when i'm 99 people aren't like you're so stuck in your ways that you can't learn or grow or adapt i sort of wish that we could have more faith and wish that we did in general put more responsibility on the elders in our community the older folks in our community to just say that they won't because of their age i think is sort of not giving them the credit they might deserve in some cases. Not every case, but some cases, right? The fact that we kind of say, oh, well, they're old, they don't have to be accepting, is kind of weird because they should be more accepting because they've lived through so much of this. They've seen it over and over again, people trying to get their rights and trying to be a, like a part of society that's valued. They should, they should be used to it. They should be ready to accept people. That makes a lot of sense. I also wonder, you know, when you all were starting to share who you were, um, what sort of resources uh, did you have? And or, because I know not everybody feels like they have resources, what sort of resources did you need? 
I use social media to completely like come out. Like I met so many people that I talked to even like two years out and like we're still best friends. But that doesn't go to say that like you don't need people in person to be there to support you. And so I wish that I would have had resources and people there for me in person. But that doesn't go to say that you can't make an impact online and reach out and text and call and do that type of stuff. When I dated my first girlfriend, uh, who I'm no longer with, my parents grounded me for my entire senior year summer. From then, we've made a lot of progress, but I feel like in some way you almost build that type of resentment towards your loved ones because when you couldn't get that support from your family, they also took away the rest of my support. But for me, I did have social media. That was the one thing my parents let me keep my phone, and that's kind of the community that kept me afloat until I was able to regain back those resources. Being able to connect to community, regardless of how you access that community, is really important, whether that's through a social media app or a friend group or a group thread. There are so many ways that we can lean on people for support when we need it. Yeah, like access to the community and also just stories. It wasn't until I was 27 years old that I was reading this story about this intersex model named Hana, who's now a friend of mine. And from the surgeries to the hormones to what the doctors told her to all these things, all of it sounded like my story. And so then I went on Google and I went down a Wikipedia rabbit hole and I was like, what's this word intersex? And I was like, wait, I'm intersex? Like, wait, 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 2% of the world is intersex? Like the same percentage of the world that has red hair or green eyes was born like me? Because I just thought I was completely alone for almost three decades of my life. And so just like having access to stories and having the media lift up our stories so that people don't have to live that much of their life feeling like they're completely alone. Yeah, like seeing possibility models Yes, is so important, right? Yeah. Like being able to see other folks like you, right? I've often said that uh, as far as being trans goes, a better indicator of being trans is euphoria rather than dysphoria. Because dysphoria is kind of weird. It feels weird. You don't really, can't really recognize it all the time. But euphoria is right there in your face. It's like, okay, this makes me feel good. This makes me feel happy. And that's way easier to recognize what is right for you. Right. And like people that you love, you're always saying, I just want you to be happy. So I'm like, oh, cool. Well, I found this thing that makes me happy. So you're going to get with it? You're going <laughs> to yeah. Uh, and it's like, the answer should just always be yes, right? If you're not harming anyone else and you're creating a space that feels more authentic for you, yes, I'm going to get with it. I feel like sometimes even like we're limited in our expression or it's like, oh, you came out, like, that's it. No. Oh, like, oh, you want to start expressing yourself now. Oh, you're doing too much. You're like, you just need to tone it down a little bit. And I really think it's important to know that like, you deserve everything that you want to make you feel good. Like you can dress how you want. You can do anything that you want that makes you feel good. It doesn't just have to stop with, oh, I came out and told people now. Like it, it can go so far beyond that. Yeah. I feel like if there are adults who have LGBTQIA queer youth in their lives, they could listen to this conversation and be like, oh, I've learned some things about how to better support folks. But I'm also thinking about the LGBTQIA queer youth who are listening in on our conversation. And I'm curious, what sort of resources or things would you want to leave that audience with? Definitely don't be afraid to speak out. Even like messaging someone you see online who like you look up to. I like, I just know like everyone that's in the queer community like knows like we don't know exactly what you're going through because everyone's story is different, but we definitely have a more similar experience than anyone else. Yeah, I know that anytime I get a message from anyone in the community that says, you know, like, I admire you or this, I'm having trouble with this or something like that, it always makes me feel an even closer sense of community and that I'm actually, like, helping people. I think for me, I really want to go back to the fact that community and friendships are so important. A lot of people feel ashamed to take steps like counseling or therapy or simply don't have access to it but building that community that is not illegitimate like that is a real thing that will actually help you so i just say don't be afraid uh to find that community the word that's coming to mind 
with what y'all are saying is chosen family. Exactly. Yes, Absolutely. yes, exactly. Family. That's what was in so my head. big yes. in the queer community. Yeah, as a foster parent, y'all, the word chosen family is flowing through my lived experience and perspective yeah. because I think about, oh my gosh, when my family wasn't there for me, my family was there for <laughs> yes. me. Yes, yeah. yeah. Right? Like, the reason why queer folks are so open to other queer folks is because we're like, I know what it's like to need family. I know what it's like to need someone to show up in my life. And that chosen family mantra is more than just, you know, noise. And I feel like we can create, you know, a queer community that we want and need. We don't have to wait for other people to create it for us. Community is something that really gets us through. Right. <laughs> y'all, thank you so much. This has been a beautiful conversation. Thank you all for being here. Uh, thank you. Let's yes. be thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks everyone for existing. Yes. 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 For being for you. <laughs> yeah. And cut. Now the most important question of all: Is it GIF or JIF? Skippy. Oh. <laughs> the exciting part about this thing is that we're just here to be ourselves and like have fun. <laughs> the boxes don't exist is a new tattoo idea. Yeah. <laughs> I feel. Maybe all of us matching tats? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>